well and uh, welcome to uh, this presentation and uh, sorry for the delay. I want to welcome us to number 30 on uh, our presentation and that is a uh, response of G.I. Butler to the living temple and the difference between the spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit. And so I like to pray and then uh, we can delve much into this. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, you are above all and thou alone can instruct us and who else teaches like our heavenly Father. This hour we want to learn of the truth and let the truth settle in our mind once uh, uh, we hear it and uh, let not the enemy rob it uh, from us. Continue guiding us. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, I was able to, uh, in the last series, uh, in the last presentation, talk about the response of uh, E.J. Wagona on the Living Temple. And uh, I hope that uh, we are continuing to learn daily in the school of Christ, that um, we are continuing to learn daily in the school of Christ. And as we learn, how I pray that um, these things may resonate with us, where we have been wrong, we may be able to correct, and uh, where we have been right, we may not brag, but uh, in humbleness, walk in the truth. And so there's a letter I want to read. The, we just uh, went through the letter of E.J. Wagner to Prescott. I want to go through the letter of G.I. Butler to Caleb, responding about these issues of the living temple and how he saw that uh, the spirit worked in a, a different way than uh, what Kellogg was talking about. <clears throat> and so this is um, Office of uh, the Southern uh, Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventist um, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. G.I. Butler, the president, uh, E.V. Orrell as the secretary, and I.A. Ford as the treasurer. And uh, this is a letter written in August 12, 1904 to Dr. J.H. Kellogg after the release of uh, the Living Temple in uh, 1903, headed towards the disfellowship of uh, Dr. Kellogg in 1907. And remember, uh, this was after the review, the, the, the sanitarium burned down in February, and the review and herald in uh, December of 1902. I don't know if I have interchanged that. You can counter check, but that is the thing. And so G.I. Butler response. We have gone through uh, Daniel's response, E.T. Jones' response, E.J. Wagoner's response, and now we are on the president himself response to G uh, to Kellogg. Dr. J.H. Kellogg, Battle Creek, Michigan. Very dear doctor, you as of July 30 came to hand some little time since. You requested me to read it to Angus Stephen, so I had to wait until I got down to this camp meeting, which I reached day before yesterday, and read it to him. I see you had not received my lengthy letter, which must have come to you in a day or so after a reply to a previous letter. I express the opinion, if I remember correctly, that I thought it was hardly worthwhile to write any more lengthy letters, only to keep up a friendly correspondence. As John was about to leave me while I go on my way to Florida, he remaining here in Georgia. I start day after tomorrow. But you have presented matters in such a, a shape in your letter that I should not feel quite willing to let it stand just that way. As if I understand your effort, you undertake to show that the doctrine you taught in living temple was all straight and correct. This, you know, I do not believe. I stand with the testimonies on this subject and not because the testimonies say it merely, not because they have always been my views and I expect always will be. Now, Daniel Prescott stood with the testimonies and E.G. White, Wagoner and Jonas. 
uh, stood uh, on, uh, or, on or, or stood with uh, Kellogg on his writing. So G.I. Butler is saying that uh, I don't view things the way you view them. I stand with the testimonies and that she, he means with Sister White's writing. So we have here Prescott, Daniels, and now G.I. Butler siding with uh, E.G. White. And then he will go ahead and explain these things. But uh, what Yone said, we find nothing to recommend this book to the committee for publishing. Uh, that it was Etty Jones who was uh, uh, reviewing the book. E.J. Wagoner, who came to let her read it but was not on the review team, said, with uh, some um, modification, I see no reason why this should not be circulated all over it. In fact, it's a better book than what we have been publishing and sending out. Just wanted to give us that reminder. But uh, you have pretended presented matters in a shape in your letter, and that is what I have read, that I should not feel quite willing to let it stand just that way, as if I understand your effort. You undertake to show that the doctrine you taught in the living temple was all straight and correct. He goes ahead and says, this you know I do not believe. I stand with the testimonies on this subject, and not because the testimonies say it merely, but because they have always been my views and I expect always will be. I never could see any sense in some of the positions you advance. You remember that the very first time you broached the subject to me, sending me some proofs, I told you I did not have any faith in those positions and did not think them in harmony with the word of God. Uncle Stephen and I have talked over this subject at some little length, and so far as I know, we agree exactly in our position. And this is uh, Stephen Haskell. Both are absolutely opposed to some ideas you advance. Um, so in one sense, this may be considered a joint letter. That is the joint letter of G.I. Butler and Stephen Haskell to Kellogg corresponding to or responding to the living temple. Probably he will have an opportunity to read it, though possibly not until after John has sent you the original, as I shall have to leave it with John to finish and he will send a copy to Brother Haskell. I have no idea that I shall vary a hair from Brother Haskell's views. So as you general group us together, you will have the word substantially from both of us. And so here we confirm that this is uh, Uncle Stephen is Haskell or Haskell. I shall not enter into this because of any desire upon my part to have a lengthy argument. I do not like to enter into contests of this kind as well as I used to when younger. You know, you and I measured swords several times over the salt question, over the resurrection question et al. Very interesting that uh, G.I. Butler had a problem with Kellogg on the use of salt and the issue of resurrection. But I won't go into that. You check out the history and saw what the salt was about and how E.G. White came in to correct uh, the issue also on the health reform. Uh, because some were saying no salt at all. Of course, I realize when I sit down to an argument with you that I have no mean opponent. Very interesting that Kellogg was a very learned person and uh, G.I. Butler recognized that. I know that you can come as near making the worse appear the better reason as any man I ever knew. Or no, I think you have remarkable versatility of mind in that direction, doctor. Though I have always given you credit for honesty and integrity of purpose. But you are a man of a good many resources, more, I think, than I have. I am simply a plain matter-of-fact person who tries to present my thoughts as possibly as I know how. But so far as dialects, dialectics, are concerned, you have greatly the advantage of me, but enough of this. I have no disposition to bandy epithets or attribute to you evil motives or anything of the kind. That is none of my business. That is none of my business. And then goes ahead to say, my difficulties with you are radical, and in the very nature of things, uh, I, op I am opposed to your views. 
you have virtually as far as i am able to judge taken the ground that living temple was all right that you simply made those changes to try to make it a little more palatable but you have never changed your views so far as i am able to design doctor in the slightest degree in reference to the living temple so what gonna say is if there is modifications which Kelo will accept the book can go out and it's a good book. Sister White said this book cannot be patched and then presented as a book to the people. Butler is saying that uh, even though you have corrected these things in words, yet your belief is same. So what I understand, it is not just enough for us to modify the word we use when we have air. It is good to change our views also. Modifying the word doesn't help in any way. And uh, this has been even in the issue of uh, uh, Trinity and uh, the Father and the Son uh, uh, debates. Now, the Trinitarian come seeing that uh, uh, they are maybe being pushed that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. They have chosen the word Godhead and then replaced the word Trinity with Godhead as if now by changing from Trinity the word Trinity to Godhead will change the implications and the meaning of things. According to G.I. Butler, it is not the changing of the words, but the concepts we are having uh, even as we change this word. So you can change from Trinity to Godhead, but the views are the same, the concepts are the same. There is nothing you have changed. So you cannot hide, hide behind words. You have to implicitly change the concepts and everything that uh, uh, you have erred in. So... Uh, he continues to say, you have not changed. In taking such a position, you place yourself athwart the testimonies emphatically. Indeed, you come right out and say that Sister White is mistaken. Now, I do not believe that she is mistaken. I believe you are the man who is mistaken and that you are advancing views which really lead to doctrines held by the heathen more than the doctrine taught in the word of God. Now that... Now, that is straight and square, but I think it is actually so. I shall try to show you that it is that it is before I get through. We will start. Therefore, on the basis that you do not accept the teaching of the testimonies brought out at a great length in her writings, over and over repeated, that your book living temple is not sound, that it teaches errors, dangerous errors. There is exactly where Brother Heskel and I stand. So this matter is really a radical matter between us. Not that we should attribute to you wicked motives. A great many people can be mistaken and yet be honest Christians meanwhile. So understand me distinctly that I have no evil motives to impute, but you are mistaken in your philosophy. Of course, this fact goes a good ways with me that my views without any presentation of them to Sister White and without ever having spoken with her on the subject in my life are precisely those endorsed by the testimonies, are precisely the doctrines I have taught and Elder Haskell has taught. We always have taught this and they have been the doctrine of this body, that is Seventh-day Adventism. Your doctrine is radically opposite to all that Elder James White, Elder J.N. Andrews, Elder Uriah Smith, and Elder Wagoner, uh, and this is the father of E.J. Wagoner, that is um, J.H. Wagoner, the leading men in the origination of this course taught. So whatever Kellogg was teaching didn't have any place in the pioneers' doctrines. Your doctrine is radically contrary to the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine as always held by this body. And by those who are representative men in it, it is a new offshoot from Elder Wagner's and Elder Prescott's views as adopted and taught all through this denomination, and your medical fraternity have adopted them. Interesting that the doctrine which actually Kellogg is teaching, it is a new offshoot from Elder Wagner's and Elder Prescott's views as adopted and taught all through this denomination. So, we might as well understand the bearings of this subject to start on. Sister White's view simply endorsed the good old doctrines of this denomination. Very interesting. 
for people to say that she later changed when she endorsed the doctrines. You and your sympathetic brethren are following on another track. I was alarmed several years ago when I began to see these doctrines first broached. I knew they were not true. They came through such a philosophical minds as Elder J. Wagoners, and as far as I know, Brother Jones has endorsed them to a considerable extent and a whole lot more. But the line is being drawn and this will not stand as one of the doctrines of this body of Seventh-day Adventists as a people. They never will in my judgment. Pause. G.I. Butler says, what Kellogg is teaching is the errors of Wagoner and Jones. And Jones and Wagoners have embraced them. Meaning that, and this is we, this we went through when we were looking at what E.T. Jones had to say when he was on the committee and what Wagoner had to say when he was in the committee. Now, Kellogg said what Spicer was saying was not true at all about him. And some people say that actually what Spicer reported about Kellogg may not be true. But here is G.I. Butler saying that um, these things, they are true. So we can give merit to what W.A. Spicer said in How the Spirit of Prophecy Met the, Christ, uh, the Crisis. We can uh, believe now the story of uh, G.I. Butler and, and Haskell also. And so it continues. I do not know that I care to discuss the question of skepticism concerning which you speak, as derived from the living temple. That word skepticism is a word that cannot be defined exactly as it covers all varieties of doctrines contrary to the express revelations of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are, there are all sorts of shades of it. Multitudes of people who call themselves Christians and Christians ministers at that are really skeptical, but they do not think so. You do not think this doctrine leads to it, but I do. Perhaps this is all I should say on that point. As I used to point out and point out and uh, out skeptic myself, and have always, because of that, been able to detect things of that kind. He had been a skeptic, and now he can detect skepticism. Perhaps more than who had always been a Christian. I think I am pretty well qualified to say what is skeptical in it is nature that leads away from the plain teachings of the word of God. Now, so far as the matter between us is concerned, I wish to simmer that down to about as fine a point as possible. Agree to all that we can agree to and differ only when we have to. What a better approach of things in such a matters. You know, when we meet and we have differences, our swords are drawn to point out differences. But here is G.I. Butler saying, I have to agree with you what we have to agree and then disagree where we disagree. If we can start at that platform, at that start point, uh, 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 standpoint, tell a brother, yes, I differ with you, but let us start at a point. This is what I agree. This is a series of things I agree with you. But next, these are the objectionable part. But that is not exactly what we do. We go guns blessing to show each other where we are wrong. That the power of God, now he starts the most interesting parts which uh, we can be attentive. G.I. Butler goes ahead to say that the power of God is working all through nature, I believe, as much as you do. Let us agree where we can agree. Then we can disagree where we disagree. So here is Butler agreeing with Kellogg, that the power of God is working all through the nature, I believe as much as you do. But I certainly draw a distinction between the power of God as exerted in various ways and in various manners and in manifestations which I cannot exp explain nor which any other person under heaven can explain. I believe that life, wherever it exists, 
was derived from God and that in some way, mysterious to myself and to you and all philosophers who have ever existed, it is still working. I believe that that life is in the bug or in the piecemeal as well as in the elephant and man, but I do not believe that that life is God. So there is life derived from God in everything. And I, as we continue with this, I want to simmer down to this. Is it the spirit in everything or is it the Holy Spirit in everything? This is what actually G.I. Butler is addressing. And he says that there is a distinction of these things. The heathen do believe this, and you in some of your remarks seem to me almost to be on the heathen side of the question. In speaking of Christ, John says, in the beginning was the word Christ, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It does not say that that life was Christ, or that Christ was that life, but in him was life and the life was the light of men. That principle of life proceeds from God and Christ. I take the absolute statement of the word that Christ was the son of God, of the same substance and nature. I believe that text which you quote, that in him the Godhead was bodily manifested, that he was in Christ in a sense that he is in no other being existing in heaven or on earth or in the universe. He was the son of God in a sense that nobody else is. So here is again an agreement. I take the absolute statement of the word that Christ was the son of God of the same substance and nature. Here we agree. I believe that text which you quote, that in him the Godhead was bodily manifested, that he was in Christ in a sense that he is in no other being existing in heaven or the earth or in the universe. This also we agree. This is G.I. Butler agreeing with Kelo. And in a sense that nobody else is, Jesus Christ is the son of God, in a sense that nobody else is. That one we can say amen to it if Kellogg says it or if G.I. Butler says it. Now, the whole hidden world and the Christian scientists, and I think my dear friend Dr. Kellogg are off on this idea that life is God and that life, wherever manifested, is a part of God. I do not believe that the scripture maintains any such an idea. Now, this paragraph cuts across both non-Trinitarians and Trinitarians to say a part of God is in something. Listen again to what G.I. is saying. Now the whole heathen world and the Christian scientists, and I think my dear friend Dr. Kellogg are off on this idea that life is God. And that that life, wherever manifested, is a part of God. I do not believe that the scripture maintains any such a thing. And also me as the presenter, I don't believe that a part of God is his, uh, the life of God is uh, a part of God in something. I must illustrate it by the sun and the light which proceeds from the sun, more forcibly than you can in regard to life. It is said in the Bible that God is a sun. It does not say anything anywhere that God is life that I can recall, but in God was life. We behold the light of day shining all around. When the sun is around on the other side of the earth, everything is dark, sometimes pitchy dark, and no light is discernible to our eyesight. When the sun arises, which was made the light bearer at the creation, Genesis first chapter, the light shines all around us. That light comes from the sun, but that light is not the sun. Very interesting uh, concepts. By no process of reasoning, twisting, or turning, or any way can it be made to appear that the light is the sun. It proceeds from the sun. The sun is the source of light to us, but the light is not the sun. No more is life God. Here is a point, doctor, which I am willing to predicate the whole argument on. And here is where you go astray. You and your friends hold a strange position, which I have never before heard of in all my studies of theology. I can understand the Buddhists and the Brahmins' position that God is a sort of an essence distributed all through nature. 
That is the Christian sand doctrine, and multitudes are teaching it today in substance. I can see some consistent in that. When they say this is all uh, where this is where is of God, where the, the is of God. What is his distribute what he is distributed through nature in the form of an essence so minute and so fine that there is no microscope under heaven that can find a particle of him. That is their view. And so as you bring up the good Hindu who could bow down and worship God in the tree, that is not pantheism. You say in the flower where life is, it bows down and worships. And you seem to endorse that doctrine as far as I can see. And thus place yourself on the heathen side instead of the Christian side. You understand me. I do not say that these Hindus worship the trees. They worship God that is in the tree. You say and you seem to endorse that idea. And you can pray to the God in the tree, not praying to the tree. And so you can start understanding the concepts of Kellogg and um, it is good to give maybe credit where it is. Kellogg says that where the life of God is manifested, there is no problem worshipping. And so you can worship the life in the tree and say you are not worshipping the tree. But how far can we just go with that? is what actually G.I. Butler is talking about. But they do not believe in any personal God up in heaven. Therefore, their system is consistent with itself throughout. But you have a personal God up in heaven sitting on a throne, dwelling in a temple literally with angels all around him. So the difference between Kellogg's understanding and the Hindu's understanding is that the Hindus don't believe there is God in heaven. They believe that his life is manifested everywhere and so he is everywhere. And they are consistent with that. But here is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the inconsistent with Kelo. God is in heaven, surrounded by angels, but also his life is manifested everywhere and so he is at that place. A part of him is at that place. G.I. Butler is telling him this can never be. And this is not consistent. You better be consistent as the Hindus that um, actually the life of God is everywhere and you can worship that and God is not have in heaven, meaning that God is everywhere. That personal being great and glorious is represented in the seventh chapter of Daniel as the ancient of days, presiding over the judgment scene as literal and actual a person as you and I are or Christ ever was on earth and yet is disseminated all through nature at the same time on the same hypothesis that the heathen have their essence God distributed all through the universe. You have two systems utterly diverse from each other, mingled into one. And there is where you are way away off the map. You cannot make those two united together. God is in heaven and God is everywhere. I think that is it. Only on the same kind of logic that you can make the sun and light one and the same thing. If And I, I found the consistency in what um, actually G.I. Butler is talking about. The light comes from the sun. And uh, we can see the light inside the house. The light can come into the house through the window coming from the sun. But will you say the sun is in the house? Think about that. You can never say the sun is in the house because the light comes from the sun and it goes through the window or the door and it is in the house. No person who have a sane mind will say the sun is in the house because the light of the sun is in the house. So to say God is in nature because the life of God has been disseminated in all nature is like a, a person who will say there is sun in my house because the light of the sun is in the house. I think you see the consistency of G.I. Butler in that. So you have two systems utterly diverse from each other, mingled into one, and there is where you are away off the mark. You cannot make these two united together only on the same kind of logic that you can make the sun and light one and the same thing. They are not one and the same thing. There is a literal body which sheds abroad the light, which we call the sun. It arises every day and shines over the earth as it goes along disseminating light everywhere. So God is a source of light and power. 
Now, there is another point upon which you enlarge considerably. Because certain power is manifested through a great variety of agencies from the huge elephant walking upon the earth, man, beast, birds, fishes, a power manifest there, you assume that this is a personal God. So the personal God is where? In the elephant. The personal God is walking on the earth. The personal God is in the beast, in the birds, in the fishes, in the flower. And you can go on because the life of this personal God is manifested there. This is what Kellogg is saying. Now that assumption seems to mean nothing more than um, uh, consummate folly, whichever that word means. How do you know that that is a personal God manifest in those ways? Has not God power which he can exert without being personal present? If he has not, he is worse off than I ever supposed he was. I cannot tell. And you say you cannot tell how he does this or just what is the nature of this power you cannot say. And I cannot say that it is the spirit of God that does it. We do not know what does it, but we know that something does it and proceeds away from God. But that does not make God an essence floating through the universe everywhere in general and nowhere in particular. He dwells somewhere. And for aught I know, he came down with Christ on Mount Sinai. And the, reveal, the, the revelator tells us plainly that he will dwell on this earth when Christ does, by and by in the new earth. And so this is where actually we quote Sister White that uh, the nature of the spirit is a mystery. You cannot just explain. And this is the thought that uh, the thought process of G.I. Butler. No one can uh, actually start saying uh, or uh, explaining the nature of uh, the spirit. Now, my good friend, if I understand your position, it is just this. While you believe in a personal God up in heaven, which, by the way, I do not see as you have any need of, if he is personally present all through the universe at the same time, it seems to me you have adopted that feature to escape certain conclusion which the Bible presents. And you cannot very well get around, for certainly it is a great incongruity for you to represent a personal God in heaven actually existing as really as Christ was seen was when he ascended up on high and yet say that he is in the form of of an essence all through creation. How can he be in heaven and also be an essence pervading all nature? That one, he says that it cannot be and it cannot be uh, reconciled. Then he goes ahead to say, as I said before, as I said before, there is diversity of positions there, mingled together, which make an incongruity which you cannot escape. Your supposition seems to be that God is personally present in heaven and is just as really personally present in man in the work, uh, in the work of uh, creating in the fish and the fowl in the work of creating in the tree, there, there is vegetable life, and that in every bug and insect, this life is manifested. All have a personal God dwelling in them. You seem to be in quite warm sympathy with the dear Hindu, who tells you that he bows down before the flower, not to worship the flower, but the God that is in it. Now, please tell me, my beloved doctor, if God is really and personally in man or in the flower or in the tree or in the beast or in fish, because life is manifested there, why do you not bow down before them just as the Hindu does? I should therefore expect if consistency was carried out with your apparent belief in the Hindu's way of worship, that you will be going around and worshiping the flowers and the jackasses, and the fish, and the animal creation, and man himself, because God is personally dwelling in them. I venture to say that it will be some time before our beloved doctor will carry out the doctrine which he has in sentiment seemed to teach. 
Why? Because the innate good sense in the man knows that it is an unfit thing to do. But if God is personally present all through there, I would like to know why not. I do not, I do feel sure, doctor, that you cannot help seeing with your wise mind that there is a great difference between worshiping God in heaven and manifestations merely of life, which come from God, in some way mysterious to everybody in anything in which life is to be found. The hidden idea is utterly false from beginning to end. It is just as false when Dr. Kellogg teaches it as it is when the hidden, hidden teach it. Now, another thing, your method of argument on that point reminds me of the Catholic argument on the second commandment. When you find any good Catholic anywhere who bows down before the image of the Virgin Mary or Jesus Christ or St. Patrick or anybody else and say to him, why are you worshipping that image? He will reply, oh no, I am not worshipping that image. I am worshipping the saint or Christ that is represented by that image. And hence, I'm not breaking the second commandment. So if you worship the flower, you are not breaking any commandment because you are worshipping the personal God in the flower by the life manifested there. These are the logical conclusion that somebody has to have. That is precisely what every idolater worshipping any image will say in regard to that. Venus, Jupiter, Mercury, or any of the rest of them, that they do not worship the image, and yet that idolatry is squarely condemned by the commandment of God. Why? Because there is a false conception, a miserable satanic idea, which is calculated to lead away minds from the true God. God is in heaven, the object of worship there. And anything that takes away our worship of God in heaven and puts it into another manifestation of life is false from the teaching of the scripture and false from good sense. I have talked with good Catholics. In fact, we had a good sister who came out at um, uh, Sigon, a very intelligent German lady, rich. She actually came out and kept the Sabbath. We rented a part of the house in which she and her husband lived. She became acquainted with us and was, in many respects, a most estimable lady. But notwithstanding, she had embraced the Sabbath when it came to taking away the image of the Virgin and some other image she loved to bow before and pray to. When we remonstrated with her on that idea, stated that it brought up the idea of God so much more fully before her mind that she could not leave it off and so quit keeping the Sabbath. That idea had been drilled into her mind until the false conception became a reality to her and she could not draw away from it. Pause for a moment because this hit direct with the Eucharist and consubsta consubstantiation where actually the, 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 the bread is turned into the real thing, the body of Jesus Christ. And why do I bring in consubstantiation? Because this woman had been real that when the life is manifested in something, that is the, the very thing. And so she could not live alone the images because she thought that these images brought her near to God than anything. And when she was approached, she left keeping the Sabbath. And, uh, you know, when Kellogg actually was warned about this thing, he left Adventism because these things were so dear to him. That is the way Satan has ruined the human family. He is willing that people should bow down before a tree or a flower, an animal or anything else. That is why the sacred calf among the ancient Egyptians or the bull Epis was selected on the death of his predecessor and washed on the same principle because life was in him, therefore God was in him. And it seems a little surprising to me that our smartest doctors cannot see that simple principle away with the whole brood. God is personal in heaven and there he lives and reigns. You have dwelled quite at length upon another point which I will notice. I think your distinction 
will not stand the test of the bodily presence. I think your distinction will not stand the test of a true and a careful examination. It is rather a difficult matter to enter into it without being too prolix. But I looked at it in Mr. Webster's International Dictionary, the latest edition, which I have, and studied every definition where he brings in the words person or personality or personal or any of those. And I cannot find one single meaning that could separate between the actual person that is represented and the being himself. The person is the being himself. And any influence that goes out from the person is not the person himself. So far as I could uh, see from a careful study of those meanings in the standard dictionary of our language. And uh, I'll just repeat this point that um, the person is the being himself. And any influence that is, goes out from the person is not the person himself. So far as I could see from a careful study of those meanings in the standard dictionary of our language. So the person is the being, but the representative is not that person. Literal, I mean. The word body or bodily can be used in different sense, irrespective of the life. When I die, my body is not the same as when I lived. There is an important something that makes a great deal difference between me when I, I am alive though the body will cover a dead condition as well as a live condition. I know there are those who believe in attenuated spirits sailing around in the air and think they are real beings, as the great mass of immortal solists do. Uh, they try to stretch that idea of personal and personality to cover their imaginary existence. That is about all I can see in reference to that use of the personal which you try to uphold. When we speak of the person of God, we speak of him who is on the throne of God or in the heaven of heavens above, that living existence whose power animates all creation. And when you undertake to apply that to a manifestation of life in the vegetable or in the animal, in every being in the universe, you have gone astray. I do not believe in your doctrine on that point at all. Now, so far as life is concerned, in all it is manifestations, I cannot explain it, as I have said before, nor can anybody else. There is not a philosopher under heaven who can explain or understand what life is or manufacture it in any way. They cannot create even a bug or a piecemeal. They cannot impart it. That is a power which God has reserved in his own keeping. And what the real nature of that power is, you nor I nor any other man can tell. I do not attempt to explain it. And you say you do not, but you draw a conclusion that the person of God is there. It was brought right out in so many words in your first edition of the Living Temple, personally and actively present in the human body. It is just as actively present in the beast body. The same process of nutrition and assimilation go in every living creature, substantially. It may not be just the same, but it results where growth, the manifestation of life, it is, are sustained by the substances which they appropriate from nature to keep life up. Now, that idea that that life is God himself is simply an inference and an unnecessary inference. There is nothing to be found in the Bible that will endorse any such a position as that. Neither is there any good sense in it that you take for granted. You say, therefore, when it is, when it is not there for at all, all there is to it that you know, or any philosopher in this world knows, is that there is a manifestation of something we call life. And what that life is, nobody can tell. There are all kinds of power dwelling in God. We cannot understand it. For example, when the wickedness of Sodomites um, was consummated from some power or other fire and brimstone descended, and those cities were consumed until they were buried out of sight in the waters of the Dead Sea, very likely. So he says, 
uh, there are all kinds of power dwelling in God. We cannot understand it. For example, when the wickedness of the Sodom Sodomites were consummated for from some power or other fire and brimstone descended and those cities were consumed until they were buried out of sight in the waters of the Dead Sea, very likely. They cease to be a city and all the surrounding country is horrible desert, the most awful in the world almost. There was a power that descended upon them. That power came from God. Was that life? No. It was anything but that, but it was a power that came from God. So it will be when the world is destroyed with the coming of Christ. When um, all the powers will be manifested there that will dissolve, desolate every temple and every city in the world and leave our world as blank, a void as it was before God created anything. But it is a substance, though without form and void. As the prophet Jeremiah says, and as God described it in the original, when um, St. Cherry blamed out his blasphemous host and threatened what he would do at Jerusalem and blasphemed the God of heaven, there came down power in one night that laid out 185,000 men. That power came from God. You could not call it life. You could not call it a part of God. It was power that proceeded from him. If I must stop and reason at length, I could present a great many other powers that are manifested. It does not follow because there is a power manifested and because it's the author, of, because God is the author of the, that power, that that is he himself. The inference is entirely the opposite from what you take it to be, doctor. As I view it, it is the very best evidence that it is not God. It is not God. And so uh, here we are seeing actually uh, uh, G.I. Butler distinguishing between the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, and the power uh, of God. And uh, it turns out to be very, very, very interesting. Continued on. If I might stop and reason at length, and uh, uh, I could present a great many other powers that are manifest manifested. It does not follow because there is a power manifested and because God is the author of that power that that is he himself. The inference is entirely the opposite from what you take it to be, doctor, as I view it. It is the very best evidence that it is not God. There is life in the angels that fell from heaven. Now, this is going to get interesting. Satan and all his host, one third part of the angel of God fell. They have lived for 6,000 years at least since they fell. They are preserved. Is God living in the devil and all his angels personally? Why, doctor, that seems to me the most preposterous uh, idea in the world. I must say it honestly. You remember what Wagner said? that God is in everything, but everything is not God. Wagner went ahead to say God is in the sinner or else the sinner will not be alive. Now, I don't want to blow out the thoughts and the motives of Wagner because I, I never spoke to him, but there are people who are listening to him and they say these things are wrong. They were imbibing the errors of uh, Dr. Kelo. Those who are surrounding Kelo were imbibing his spirit and his reasoning. G.I. Butler says, the angels have the spirit or the life of God sustaining them. Now, if we want to be consistent enough that where God is manifested or where his life is, we can worship, not worshiping the thing, but worshiping the life in him. Why should we object worshiping before the presence of Satan? Because the life of God is in Satan. The spirit of God is in Satan. And we are not worshipping Satan, but we are worshipping the life of God in Satan. Why stop doing that if we want to be consistent enough that where the life of God is, personally, he is there. This is the reasoning of uh, E.J. Wagoner, and this is the reasoning of Kellogg, 
and to some extent the reasoning of A.T. Jones, that God is personal there where his life is. So, and others go to the extent of we are not worshipping the thing, but we are worshipping what is in it. And so why not just look for where the devil is and worship the life of God in him? In fact, everyone will be shocked when you say, okay, this is what I'm doing. If Satan was present there and you bow down and say, no, you know, I'm not worshiping Satan. I'm worshiping the life in him because God's life is in him. Then I'm worshiping him. Somebody will be shocked with what you are saying. So to be consistent enough, let us not stop at some road, but let us go fully. And to it is logical conclusion when we say that where the life of God is manifested, we can actually worship that thing, worship at that place, not worshiping the thing, but worshiping the life in it. And that is why these cuts are cross Trinitarians and non-Trinitarians. And so why not worship these angels? Why did even angel Gabriel say, do not bow down before me? John could have simply told him, you know what? I'm not worshiping you, angel Gabriel. I'm worshiping the life in you, which is the personal God. But John never went ahead to worship the angel. When he was told, don't do that, he knew exactly what angel Gabriel was saying and he stopped it. There is life in the angels. We have read that in reference to the healing influences with which you are so familiar and which are going on in the restoration from diseased condition to health and the power which God has exerted and is exerting in harmony with those efforts. I believe this just as much as you do, but I do not believe because there is a power there which God exerts through these instrumentalities that it is God himself. That is where we differ. So he, G.I. Butler is approaching these things in a very sober way. We agree on this, but this we don't agree. So he continues to say, there you draw conclusions which are not warranted. Your logic, if carried out to its ultimate conclusion, will be that wherever God manifests a power, that that is he himself personally. I deny that inference. That brings in the heat and conception rather than the truth of the Bible. In regard to the miracle which Christ performed when he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee, there was power that went forth from Christ which changed those conditions instantly. You change them gradually. No doubt that power that works to help them change comes forth from God as it did from Christ. When the poor woman came up with the issue of blood and touched his garment, hoping not to be seen, her faith grasping Christ as the real object that would or could bring her healing. She touched it, and the power went forth from him. But it was not Christ himself going forth to the woman. Very interesting and very sober. Now, according to your own reasoning, the power that is exerted in the healing of a person today may be similar to that power. I have no particular objection to that but it was not God personally going forth or Christ personally going forth. It was a power derived from Christ and derived from God. There is where you are in the dark, my good doctor. Christ wrote many of these miracles. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the spirit of God on a most solemn occasion, there was the power that came uh, from God. There They were both corpses there was God personally dwelling in Ananias and Sapphira all because a power came from him. When that medium of the devil, Elimas, the sorcerer, withstood uh, uh, him seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, Paul filled with the Holy Ghost sat, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all unrighteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, because be, and now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a reason, for a season. Sorry. And immediately, 
there fell on him a mist in the darkness, and he went about seeking some someone to lead him by the hand. There was another power that went forth at the command of Paul and must have come from God himself, but it was not God personally dwelling in the poor saucer, was it? Now, there, my friend, is where I consider you make the departure. You draw the conclusion because there is some power in most instances, a life-giving power in a man that therefore God personally dwells there. It is a non sequitur, doctor. It does not follow. So this is the issue. The same way life comes from God and the power and supports different things, the same way that life and power comes to man, whether a sinner or whether a Christian. Is then God in a sinner or even in a Christian? Is the manifestation of life God himself? The answer is a resounding no. God is not in the beast. God is not in the sinner. The life even manifested in a Christian on a plain view to sustain his blood running is not God himself and not part of God in any way. And so... We continue with this letter. You attach too much importance to those powers, claiming that it is just the same thing as God wrote in creation. You have no right to say all that. That it is power derived from God, I will willingly grant, but I do not grant that it is the same power that created something from nothing. The spirit of God goeth, from, goeth forth from God. So, G.I. Butler has talked about life, the natural life and power that does things and is in everything. And then he shifts the gears to the spirit at the creation. He says, the spirit of God goeth forth from God. That is what the expression, the spirit of God really signifies. The off shows that it is something connected with or proceeding from God. The scripture says, if the Greek was literally rendered, that that spirit proceedeth or goeth forth from the Father and the Son. Now, I will not dare to say that that spirit of God, which goeth forth, was the comforter. Interesting, the spirit that created in Genesis chapter 1, G.I. Butler says, this is not the comforter. Now, we have a brother who has made a show of this and says that um, I have said that uh, the comforter just started its existence after Pentecost. And G.I. Butler is so clear, the comforter, the spirit at creation is not the comforter. There is no other comforter before Christ died on the cross and went in heaven. The comforter came because they were being left as orphans. You don't give a comfort to a person who has not lost anything. Comfort is only given to somebody who has been deprived of something, maybe parents and such a thing. And Christ had been deprived the disciples. And so he needed to give them comfort. And the spirit comes in that sense as a comforter after Christ ascended in heaven. In fact, it is not my words, but the words of Christ himself and uh, I'll just have to read them in the book of uh, John, uh, the book of John, and John chapter 7, it says, John 7, 37 to 39, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, oh, sorry, uh, I have to project this. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So somebody to say that the comforter had been given before Christ was glorified, it is a stretch of the matter. It is not biblical. It is not supported anywhere. Jesus himself said that the comforter has not, had not yet been given. It was not until 
Pentecost that the comforter was given. And that is what I maintain, even though somebody may say what they want to say, that uh, I'm in error. That is the truth of the matter. The comforter was not there. These are the words of Christ in John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. The spirit had not descended. Why? Jesus Christ had not been glorified. When was he glorified? In on his inauguration to start the work in the holy place. And that was 50 days after the uh the 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 the, the, the word the the first fruit when he had resurrected and went to heaven. That is when the comforter was sent to the disciples. And some people ask an unwise question. So all this time, they didn't have the comforter for 50 days before it was poured. Now, what kind of a question is that? God can pour out his spirit the way he wants, but the comforter has not been given, Jesus says, until he was glorified. And this is what uh, G.I. Butler actually is saying, that uh, uh, the spirit of God goeth from God. That is what the expression, the spirit of God really signifies. The off shows that it is something connected with or proceeding from God. But he goes as ahead and saying, uh, now I will not dare to say that the spirit of God which goeth forth was the comforter. And here is he's referring at Genesis in creation. That was not in the earth in the same sense before the day of Pentecost. That it was afterwards. So before Pentecost, the spirit of God that goeth from him is not the same as the comforter. Until Christ was glorified, that is when the comforter came. The promise of the Holy Spirit was given by Christ himself when he was to do a great work for the disciples, to qualify themselves for the ministry after he had ascended on high. He says, if I go not away, the comforter will not come. Now there was a spirit that came in a way that it had not come before. That language necessarily proves that. And that comforter, the Holy Spirit, was manifested in the soul of man. It is that that dwells in beings who give themselves to God and thus become the temple of God. It has not an existence in everybody and every creature that lives on earth before that. Very educative and very spiritual things. Everyone has the life of God in them, but God is not in them. Everyone has a sustaining spirit in them, that life. And there is a power that works mysteriously in everything, but that is not God. And yet there is another step. The Holy Spirit is not that spirit. The Holy Spirit is accepted by faith, and that is how God dwells in the believer to sustain him spiritually. Anyone who haven't accepted Jesus Christ do not have the comforter, do not have the Holy Spirit. They have the life of God. God is not in them. His power of uh, sustaining the whole world as it is in Hebrews that he sustains the whole world with the power of his word is so different from the comforter, the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit and the Holy Spirit are two different things and the power of God is just another thing also whatsoever. And we cannot go minutely to express these things and explain them, but accept them the way they are. So there will have been no propriety in the remark of Christ that if I go not away, the comforter will not come. If the comforter was here, why would Christ say that if I not go away, he will not come? when it was already there. You know, we sometimes I have found that uh, we are in so much debate and at variance until even a simple thing that is truthful, when it is spoken by an opponent in quotes, it is just an error. Jesus says, if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. So how is it that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, was in the world before Christ ascended and was glorified? It doesn't make sense at all if it was there. And then he's saying that if I don't go, it will not come. It is oxymoron in every word, sense of the word, and it cannot be reconciled. And G.I. Butler says that these things, they are divisive. And there is no way you are going to reconcile them if you stick to the scriptures.
but you have a sympathy with the Hindus. So G.I. Butler continues to say, there will have been no propriety in the remark of Christ that if I go not away, the comforter will not come unless his going away was a condition necessary precedent to his a precedent to his coming. Now you are not authorized to say, and no other man is authorized to say that the, that spirit which came forth as the comforter and manifested itself in tongues of flame, sitting on the heads of every one of the 120 present was the same thing that is working in man, in beast, in insects and fishes and falls to keep them alive. The Holy Spirit, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. And it is not the same thing. Nobody is authorized to say that and nobody has any certainty that if they should say it, they will be telling the truth. Now there is a sense in which God was in Christ. That is not true of any other person. He was made of the same substance as the scripture declares. He was in the express image of his father's person. He was in the form of God. So God had a form. They were alike. You quote that scripture which says, if you see me, you see the father. I understand that to be you simply in this sense. There is a perfect resemblance between God, uh, the Son, and God, the Father. You see how G.I. Butler uses the word God, the Son, and God, the Father very interestingly. And uh, it is he's referring to what actually uh, Kellogg is saying. I had a pair of twin sisters, Mary and Martha, Miss Andrews and Miss Washburn. When they were little children, they were not one in 40 who could tell them apart. Suppose Mary had been in some place and I said to her, I wish I did know how your sister looked. Why? She says, you see me, you see my sister because there is a perfect resemblance. Christ says in another place, my father is greater than I, which shows that they were distinct persons. And yet he said this also, if you see me, you see the father. In that sense, and only in that sense, as I understand it, because if there is anything in this world made plain in the Bible, it is that the Son and the Father are separate and distinct persons. In the sevens of Daniel, you read that one like the Son of Man was brought before the Ancient of Days, and a kingdom and dominion was given unto him. That is not yet fulfilled, but soon will be, when the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he comes to dispossess his enemies of it. One of the things we as Seventh-day Adventists are looking for, they are perfectly distinct, and yet in a certain sense, the body of the Godhead was dwelling in the body of his son because he was made in some way inexplainable from his substance. And Sister White says that in the beginning there were two, yet little short of being identical. So your logic in regard to Christ here upon the earth and the Father being with him in a certain sense does not apply to the human family. There is a great difference. Again, there is a sense in which God and Christ dwell with every one of us. How so? Because the Spirit of God, the Comforter, is the gift of God to every believing child who will accept him truly. That Spirit cometh forth from the Father and the Son and dwells in the Christian. That spirit witnesses with his spirit that he is a child of God. If a child with God, he is an heir with God and a joint heir with Christ to an inheritance incorruptible. That is a high honor God gives to those who accept him, believe in him, partake of his spirit. But that is not the case with everybody. By a long ways, doctor, for the scripture says, as Christ says to the Jewish, ye are of your father the devil. They were not even children of Abraham in the true sense, for the true child of Abraham does as Abraham did. That is the true doctrine, my friend, which the Bible teaches and which Seventh-day Adventists have always held. Now you ask if God was present in the tabernacle in the wilderness. He was present in this sense, and only in this sense, that the Shekinah of glory was there. It appeared in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That glory of God enshrouded the temple with such a power that at times nobody could go into it and live. In that sense, God dwelt there more or less according as they lived near to him or otherwise during all the years until that spirit took its flight. When Christ hung upon the cross and said, it is done, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. 
that great and wonderful rich curtain showing that God had departed from that place. His representative had been there for a time, but had departed, and that temple was no more of God than any heathen temple was really. From that time on, though they came up and worshipped there, because God's presence had been there. In reference to your text concerning David's calling upon the Lord and his undering by fire upon the altar of burnt offerings, his undering by fire from heaven shows that God was up in heaven, and the fire proceeded from his presence as it will proceed and consume this earth, but God was not in the fire. Let me give you another scripture to balance that up. When Elijah stood upon Mount Sinai, having fled away from the presence of Jezebel, he asked that he might die. The poor man was discouraged, as you and I get sometimes, doctor. God saw fit to manifest himself to him in a particular way. A terrible tornado of wind blew, but God was not in the wind. A fire swept by. It must have been of God's manufacture, surely, but he says God was not in the fire. And a terrible earthquake fell, but God was not in the earthquake either. But there was a still small voice. And when the prophet heard that still small voice, he covered his face with reverence. You seem to be confused. And I am astonished that you are, doctor, between the manifestations of the power of God in the various ways, as he chooses to manifest himself, calling that God himself. It is strange to me that you do not see that plain distinction. I think your mind has become a little confused on that point. Yes, and Solomon's prayer, and I was surprised that you should quote that. In that beautiful prayer which he offered at the dedication of the temple, calling upon God to help the worshippers who should come to that temple and pray toward that temple, he says, Hear thou from heaven, from my dwelling place. The very language shows where God is. He was up in heaven, but he also had a representative here on the earth, the Shekinah in the temple, which, when that temple was dedicated, was filled with the glory of God, showing God's acceptance of it. But that does not necessarily prove that God came down and got into it personally by any means. Your quotation seems to me to prove just the opposite to what you quote it for. But heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. Now, there is a thought that may seem to you may seem to you to help your position, but it does not, it does not to my mind. There is nothing surer than what the Bible says, which you believe that God's habitation is in heaven and he dwells in a temple in heaven, that he has a throne there, that the earthly sanctuary was made as a representation of that temple in all its apartments. That temple is the place where God finally carries out the last great a size of the judgment. Gibbon, in speaking of the Roman emperor dwelling in Rome, writes, my power reaching over the known earth almost. He represents his power as being everywhere, all over that great empire, just as the Pope's power is reaching out into all the parts of the great dominion, working through agencies. Not that he is personally everywhere, but his power and command affect all creation. We use words in the same accommodating sense. We speak of the sun rising. Everybody speaks about it, and yet everybody knows that the sun does not rise in the technical sense. The earth turns over. We speak of Mr. Van Vanderbilt and the wonderful house he built in New York City, and yet I venture to say that he never put a brick in it and never drove a nail in it. It might also be said of the architect that he built that house, and of the carpenters and bricklayers that they built it. Everybody understands the meaning. I understand that in the sense that while God dwells in heaven, his power extends all over the universe. That does not mean that God himself is personally present all over his universe. I could not help being a little amused, doctor, when you presented before me that touching instead of the poor heathen from Calcutta and your interview with him. I am so thankful you did talk with him and use the best efforts at your command to make him see the true light. It seems you did not have much difficulty in making him see what you regard as the true light about the personal presence of God. I think, doctor, in short, your position has gone over to his doctrines. 
instead of bringing him over to ours. That seems to be very easy for you to fall in with the ideas that are taught by the Buddhists and the Brahams and by the heathen generally. That is a rather a suspicious circumstance to me, doctor. Now, I do not know whether or not I have taken up every scripture that you presented, but I have given you my idea in regard to their uh, understanding and think I am right. My last letter, which I have not received an answer from yet, but which probably come along in due season was of a more general character. It related especially to the position which you seem to have settled down solidly upon. Highly, I see, is settled upon it. All the medical fraternity are settled upon it. In other words, you are all, in other words, you all stand on the idea that Sister White is wrong that you do not accept her statements and testimonies embracing a large part or all of her recent writings, that she is mistaken and you are right. And yet you call yourself believers in the testimonies. Now, doctor, I love you. You all stand on the idea that Sister White is wrong, that you do not accept um her statements and testimonies embracing a larger part or all of her recent writings that she is mistaken and you are right and yet you call yourself believers in the testimonies. Now, doctor, I love you and always expect to. If you are lost at last, I expect to love you for the many precious qualities of mind and heart which you possess. But I feel just as certain that you are uh, taking steps that will only result in what shall I, taking step that will only result in what shall I say, in drift. I presented those thoughts before you in that letter, and I reiterate them. You think you are settling down on a solid position. There is nothing solid in this world. It is about a solid uh, position as it would be to get a big man of war out in the ocean. Um, falling sails and close down it is engines and say, we are going to stay in a stable condition. Will they? You know better. In a day, they would perhaps be scores of miles away from where they were. Why? Because there is a power underneath them that will carry them hither and yon. I tell you that power of drift is a mighty thing. You may set down your stakes and hold fast to your doc doctrines, but you will find in the outcome that you are getting farther and farther away from this body. And surely, Kellogg get out, got out of the body of our divinism. You say you are right, and your positions are right, and you are all going to hold to them. You will lose ground in a way that you do not dream of. That is just the way I view it, doctor, and it makes me feel awful, sad when I say it. And to see my own flesh and blood doing the same thing, dear Highland, I love him and as I do my life. He is a noble boy, but I tell you he is losing spirituality. No man in this course, believing as he is believing and as you have believed, can take your stand right against what the testimonies say and maintain your spirituality. You think you can, and D.M. Canwright thought he could, and shook uh, and brink off were sure they could they were going to have the loud cry in a little uh, while. If they could only get rid of the visions, but they were in universalism in a little while. Poor Canwright, where is he? If ever I pitied a man, I do him. He looks to me like a poor, seedy, used up old man. And yet he thought he was going to do a grand missionary work. And that is the proclaiming of the loud cry. And uh, finding time, I'll talk about D.M. Canwright and his apostasy. Very sad thing. And Dr. Kellogg, you are a dear man, but if you take that same position he did, you will find yourself in the same boat after a while. Oh, I feel so sorry, so sorry that I cannot express it. I shall love you and shall continue writing to you. All uh, in all, be a friend to you. You have asked me to write. You have really forced me into making these statements. I am not conscious of having said an unkind word, but have told you just how things really look to me. 
I have tried to meet some of those points you think you are right upon, but which I think you are a great, you think, but which I think are a great error. You cannot say that I have not. I believe I have done it successfully. Because of the prosperity of the sanitarium, you feel that you have a great work and are going to carry it on. The whole Jewish nation with several millions every year going up to their feast felt that their work was all right. They were going to carry that on and they did carry it on, but they did not come out any better because they carried it on and thought they were all right. There was another truth they despised and rejected. They seemed to have prosperity and power, but Gamaliel told them some truth when he said, if this thing is of God, they cannot overthrow it. As we bring this to a close, we are standing on the testimonies of God which have been in existence ever since this course commenced. You are taking your stand against them. Doctor, whether you realize it or not, and it will not be sufficient for you to believe that they have been all right, but that now Sister White is mistaken. I read your nice little piece of poetry. It is very nice and very poetry, but there are, in my judgment, some errors in it. I'll not stop to tell you what they are. Dr. Hayward is doing very well. I suppose he believes your positions. He does not have much to say about it, and I do not bother him with it. I shall not to you if you did not draw me out on it and call upon me to speak out, so I have spoken out. I did not suppose Hayley really meant what he said. I thought he was trying to tantalize me a little, as you express it. This good brother of him, of whom you speak, A.R. Henry, and several others have not, as you say, any religious life. They did have once. They took pretty nearly the same ground you are taking in rigor to the testimony some time ago. They are there, and if you do not look out, you will find yourself in the same position. I think poor brother Henry will very likely come to an awful end. That awful temper which he is now exercising upon you, as he did on some of our leading men in the course, while connected with the review office, will doubtless be very detrimental to his best good. I doubt not he did not take $20,000 or more than that right out of the review office. It was a wicked thing to do. Now, because some of you have offended him and because you did not support his son, EDC, as highly told me all about it at the fair, you are coming into some of the same thing. I regretfully fear the man will go distracted by and by or something will happen to him because he is on the wrong track and a lot of more them are there in Battle Creek. Now you can rely upon the friendship, the love and esteem of Brother Haskell and myself. We do love you dearly, both of us. We do greatly desire your salvation, but we feel sure you are wrong in some of the positions you are taking. I am pain to see you throw out little fillers concerning Willie, Sister White, and all that. Doctor, it is not worthy of you to talk that way. I heard when I was up to Battle Creek, rolling through the air, all that is Willie's testimony, such a things as those. I believe, dear doctor, are unbecoming, whoever they are derived from. I do not know as it was you that said it. Perhaps it was, I cannot tell, but they are not conducive to spirituality in one's own soul or a benefit to others. My dear, dear friend, think of these things I have said. Think them over in the fear of God. It does seem to me that they are the truth. At any rate, I expect to stand on them as long as I live. I always have stood on them. It is the doctrine of the body. It is the doctrine, the testimonies teach. You have, you, you, are, you attach a meaning to some scriptures and I think some testimonies of Sister White's which she never will admit for a moment she ever meant. When error is laid alongside of the truth, there is a line of demarcation where the two come very close to other, together. And it is a very easy thing to get over little on the same on the wrong side and hardly know it. There is where I view it. You are danger commenced. You are a man of great vers uh, vers versatility, of great powers of mind and great knowledge of argument, but your positions are wrong. So goodbye for this time, my dear dangerous, my dear brother. I love and shall pray for you, but regard you as standing upon dangerous ground. May the Lord help us to live where we can meet 
his approbation and be saved together in his kingdom. Uh, you as loving brother, G.I. Butler, and that was the president of the General Conference. That brings us to the end of that letter. It has been long, but worth going through it. Because there are just um, many things which are being thrown outside there when it comes to this power of God, the spirit of God, the life of God, and the Holy Spirit. And I think we have gone through this precisely and concisely, concisely so that everyone may not remain in doubt and not confound the power of God the life of God, the manifestation of God, and the Holy Spirit of God. When we talk about these things, that is the power of God, the life of God, the manifestations of God, which is the Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit, we are talking of four different things. And they can never be the same again. May the Lord bless you. And uh, may we stick to the truth. And may we ask Jesus Christ himself to teach us because there is no other person who teaches like Jesus Christ. And uh, with those uh, many remarks, may the Lord bless us and shall we pray. Dear Father in heaven, that uh, you will never judge us for the things that we never knew, but uh, how we have used the life that we have uh, had. We want at the end of the day to be guided by Jesus Christ, but that the light we receive we may use it in the right way. Help us also not to spend our times in debates and uh, controversies, but uh, seeking to save the souls which are in darkness. Forgive me, forgive my sins and presumptions. My errors are many, Lord. I ask forgiveness. And uh, for my brothers and sisters, Lord, to have mass upon them. Your will be done. And uh, let these things, if they are true, be able to help those who are seeking truth Help me also. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.